afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Lyle Hargrove from the Canadian Auto Workers Union, and uh, my job in the Canadian Auto Workers Union is health and safety training, uh, developing videos, and training programs for our members across Canada. And Sari Saarinen is going to work uh, with me as we go through the presentation. And I always have to talk a little bit about our union because uh, I want you to give you and I a, a flavor for what we do across Canada and why we would be a powerful force in doing a campaign against asbestos. And of course I have to introduce my brother. Uh, he takes away my paycheck if I don't, and he's president of our union. And of course he uh, wanted me to give uh, greetings from all 260,000 members across Canada and our financial secretary which supplies the money to, so we can come and, and do some great work around the, not only here but around the world. And I want to give you an idea, that we're just, we're called an auto workers union but we do represent uh, all sectors pretty well across Canada from coast to coast to coast and you can see the percentage, certainly auto is a, a major player still yeah but getting smaller and we also uh, do manufacturing, general manufacturing, we build buses, planes, uh, trains. We do a lot in the service industry, which is probably the fastest growing sector of our union as we lose good manufacturing jobs in Canada. Same as I know in the U.S. why the, we pick up members in the service industry. And I won't go through them all, you can see what they are there and just on the count of time. We have over 500 collect agreements and we negotiate annually with them 500 and 1,500 major members educated through various education programs in our union. So we continually, which we feel is the, is the heart of any uh, great organization, is to make sure your members are well educated. We have three broad-based leadership meetings involving more than a thousand of our workers. We meet pretty well annually to make sure we are on the right track, whether it be asbestos education negotiating uh, good benefits and good wages. And I want to talk a little bit about the Homes Foundry, which certainly we have worked close uh, with the Homes Foundry people in Sarnia over the years. Uh, not only to, to make sure that no more workers are getting hurt in Sarnia, but also that the families that are left behind do get some coverage. And as you can see, we're up around $25 million that we have nego negotiated with the WSIB, which is our workers' comp board, to make sure that the families are looked after in this uh, homes foundry. And we're still working there. We've been in there for a very long time. So hopefully, as time goes on, we can actually do a little better job and keep going. I work closely with the occupational health clinics, uh, Jim Brophy. Matter of fact, I actually all the clinics I chair their board, so we do work very closely on. We find and bring forward people that are getting sick from asbestosis, mesothemia, and they help us put the material ready to get uh, to put claims in, so we can have a good solid case in order to get the claim accepted by the workers' compensation board. And we uh, uh, worked with them, we negotiated uh, what you call an intake clinic where we asked workers to come, fill out forms and let us know if there is any uh, thing going on that they feel that their health is deteriorating or they have so, some suspect that they have some problems. And then uh, we had over 300 home family workers and their families turn out to that one day thing. And We've been working ever since. Of course, uh, getting the documentation is probably the cheapest thing you can do. Then you have to follow up to make sure that we don't leave anybody left off that wants to get help, and that's when the cost comes in. And of course, uh, as uh, Brophy said, and I won't spend a lot of time, is the inspectors did go in to that plant a lot of times, but didn't write any orders on, on the, the amount of asbestos in the air. And of course, he told you there's over 6,000 parts per million in some cases in the air. And we've actually had uh, one child die at 16 years old from mesothemioma by playing outside the plant, but also the milkman that filled up the machine which was in the plant for workers to drink a half a pint or a pint of milk also died of mesothemioma. 
The ministry sought legal action only once in 1975. The results in a critical injury during which a worker lost a finger. The company was fined $1,000. Now that was for a loss of finger. That was nothing to do with the asbestos. That's just a picture of the plant. Oh, sorry, that's the Peterborough Electrical Plant. And that's where my co-partner was going to take over, right? So I think I'd better let you get up. And this is just another area, but like a sign, yes, it's another small town in, in Canada was named Peterborough. Thank you, Lyle. And uh, as Lyle has explained to you, our, our union does cover many industries, but what we're trying to show you is just to give you a flavor of, of some of the manufacturing plants where the asbestos exposures began for our members. And now it has gone into a lot of the other areas. Shipbuilding, as an example, is one of the areas as well where we have a lot of our members that are coming forward. And as, uh, as Jim has painted the picture with the Ocal Clinics, we work very closely with the Ocal Clinics. And not a day goes by that our department does not get a phone call from a member across the country or a family member calling us saying, my dad worked in the shipyards or my, uh, my mom worked um, in a factory and now she's sick. How Can you help us? Can you help us find the link to show that there was exposure from the occupation and now we need to put claims forward. And a good example is the Peterborough, the um, electric city, the uh, GE plant there. With the GE plant, um, of course, they, um, they worked in a variety of different processes. You look at the, uh, the layout of the plant, and at one time there were over 6,000 people that were employed there. And the complex was built in the uh, 1800s, so it's quite old, and it's still the existing building that uh, is operational. So all of the departments had their unique processes, yet they were all connected. And asbestos was, was the connection with all of the uh, various departments. The asbestos was used to uh, wrap the uh, small electrical uh, wirings, uh, was used to, um, to wrap the wirings. There was no precautions that were given to the workers at all, same as in the Holmes Foundry. So it was a, a cesspool. People would go home, would expose their families, and then we're now living through that legacy as the, uh, the workers are coming forward. And we began a study in the uh, 90s as well as um, uh, early 2000 on uh, the asbestos exposure at the uh, Peterborough plant. And unfortunately, um, the, uh, the studies were not conclusive and we're still working with the, uh, the workers there on, uh, on giving them a clear track of where the exposures came from and actually having them uh, the ability to go in uh, and put claims forward. Another example that we have is the Arvin Meritor brake plant. For over 40 years they made uh, uh, brake assemblies for class 6, 7 and 8 trucks and it was until the late 80s that we were still using asbestos as the brake lining and uh, at that point it was replaced by fiberglass. And our first claim was filed in 2000 by a young worker who had been working there for about 17 years. And subsequent to that, we've had numerous other uh, files that um, claim files. But the interesting thing with the, the first two employers, with Holmes Foundry as well as with Peterborough, it's been like drawing blood from these employers to get information. Arvin Meritor has been, uh, if you can call an employer exemplary, has been a lot an easier employer to work with. They have recognized that, yes, asbestos is a problem. How can we sort it out? How can we work with the unions as well as the, the workers to, uh, to eliminate the asbestos exposure and move forward? How do we protect our members? When uh, the asbestos claims started coming in and, and uh, working with the intake clinics, working with the educating our membership is how do we as a union, as an organization, we're not doctors, um, we certainly have legal expertise, but, but occupational diseases is, is one of these uh, unfortunate newfound areas that uh, is certainly growing leaps and bounds. So we've tried to find different ways of how do we help. We've uh, passed a, a resolution within the parliament of our union. As Lyle mentioned, we meet uh, quarterly. There's about a thousand of our leadership and they're actually meeting this weekend at our education center in Port Elgin. And that's where we make the decisions on issues that are affecting our membership at a broad base and how do we put the political machine into place. 
and we had a ban asbestos resolution that was passed in 2003 we educate our membership, we work closely with the health and safety committees in our workplaces, and skilled trades, we've heard how skilled trades are affected by uh, toxic exposures and especially asbestos. And most importantly, we work with lobbying our municipal, provincial, and federal governments. And as we've heard, our federal government certainly doesn't do anything to, to help the export of uh, asbestos worldwide. They say that it's, uh, it's safe. Well, as you can see in many of these developing countries, you don't have many uh, uh, safe equipments, uh, safety equipments that are used, and you're broadly exposed to, uh, to asbestos in, in many forms, whether it's uh, uh, a standard by as you see a child, a family, or the worker themselves. And uh, we support the international ban of asbestos. As a union, that is uh, one of the fundamental principles that we move forward to with on a daily basis. Our activists, we, uh, when we educate our uh, membership, they're not only educated with the tools to do their day-to-day -day jobs, whether it's on a health and safety committee or on a bargaining committee, but also we educate them to be political activists, to go forward into their communities, into the political arenas, and to affect change. And we continuously work to call on the Canadian government to stop the export of this lethal white powder. And uh, we work with many organizations across the world, as well as with ADAO, to work on finally having a ban on asbestos so that next generations don't have to work with the, uh, the legacy that uh, we know asbestos has created. So we uh, support the inclusion of asbestos on the prior informed consent list. And uh, we ask that all of you work on that. The Rotterdam Convention meeting is coming up this fall. And uh, we're certainly putting a big push on it. The Ban Asbestos Canada group is working on the international groups to ensure that uh, once and for all, asbestos is going to be put on that list. So thank you for your time. And we'll move on to the next speaker.